Welcome to Sales Velocity TV, where we pull back the curtain on how the top businesses in the world sell more with less resistance. Bringing over 50 plus years of combined sales experience and over 100 million in revenue generated, please welcome the hosts of Sales Velocity TV and two incredibly entertaining gentlemen, Andrew Cass and Aaron Parkinson. Talk to me, Goose. <laughs> It's time to buzz the tower. We are live from the F-19 fighter jets at Top Gun headquarters today, folks, and it is going to be a fun one. This is the Top Gun Maverick inside the blockbuster sales machine of this monster movie, man. And yeah, we decided to pull back the curtain, have a little bit of fun today. I don't know how Tommy Cruise let us in his jets, but man, he was gracious. For those people who are wondering what the hell <laughs> you are talking about right now, we go live in Facebook every Friday at the same time. And if you're listening audio, you probably need to go over to Facebook and watch this edition or potentially to our recorded ones because we are sitting right now in F1 jets. If you've never watched the live episode, it's number 81. It's at salesvelocitytv.com. Yes, we are in the vintage F-19, F-16, not sure, F-19 fighter jets, I believe, from the Top Gun movie. Got the team around me. I think we got Rooster to my top right, and we've got Bob to the top left, and I got Aaron over here to my to my right or my left. But, yeah, it was a great one, man. And, you know, we always like to tie things back to business when we do the show. But we're going to have a little fun today because this was a phenomenal movie, even if you're not a Top Gun fan. But when we take you behind, I guess we have this, Aaron, you and I, we have – intuitive minds. We always want to think about the business model of fill in the blank. That's, that's me, right? I even, I even do this with athletes. I do it with all kinds of different things. What's the business model behind it? What's the driver? Where's the money? What are the economics look like? And it is really unbelievable what has happened here. Cause I don't think we've ever seen Aaron, a sequel to a movie 36 years later, be so, I mean, so productive and so profitable. How do you maintain that relevant brand in that relevant image to be able to even pull it off in the first place, to even have any, any interest 36 years later uh, is masterful for what they've done with the brand. And obviously what Tom Cruise has done, he'll sort of be the focal point of, of the branding and the positioning of what we'll talk about here today. But did you see the movie yet, by the way? Of course I saw the movie. Okay. Just wanted to make sure because you know, you couldn't be on the show if you didn't see the movie. No, I, I actually Minor tried to detail. rent out, I tried to rent out the entire theater and it's so popular that I couldn't rent out the theater for myself. So I had to watch it with everybody else, which was fine. And, uh, and, and, and I think because it's a sales show and you know, these numbers better than I do, cause we were talking about the, the other day, what, what's like the first two weeks revenue on this show? Ooh, like 600 million in two weekends, which is astronomical. It, it's really right. interesting. I want to, I want to talk about that for a second. One, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. However, there's sort of been this trend the last I would say probably the last maybe five years where movies have been kind of getting, a, I don't know, like a negative slant put on like traditional movies in theaters and everyone's like, oh, I just want to watch it on Netflix. Oh, I just, you know, I want to stream it. Uh, and, and, the, and the movie, traditional movie theater industry has kind of taken a beating. Yeah, Revenue, and I, don't, I don't think the COVID situation helped it either with people no, not going it, to it theaters, definitely, right? It definitely hurt it, but that was sort of a you know, kicking them while they're down scenario. And I feel like in, in all, in all marketing and, and we could go down a really weird rabbit hole here. We could talk about politics. We could talk about a whole bunch of things. Things tend to sway hard one way and then people kind of get sick of it. And then they tend to sway back the other way. Mm. Right. Which really allows you just a lot of times to, you, you got to stay up to speed with what's going on, but you can also stay true to your origins because I have been told and I've been looking at research on traditional movies this year and apparently there's like five that are expected to be absolute blockbusters financially. Yeah. One was Top Gun. Sure. One is The Return of ja Jurassic Park. I see Avatar yeah. 2 yeah. is coming out. I saw that too. You know, the, there, there seems to be this resurrection of investment behind traditional movies, you know, and a lot of them were starting to say, oh, we're, we're only going to release on Netflix first and this and then they're like, nope. You can only see this in the theater. That's it right. has to be experienced this way or no other way at all. And this is the first of the bomb drops of the resurrection of the traditional 
movie industry and, and look at the finances behind it. I, I got to tell you, I love the move. Tom Cruise was adamant about this. He said, this is absolutely going to be an in-theater movie. This is how he came up. So I think because of his generation and because he's been doing this for 40 plus years, his whole thing was, we're going we're gonna to bring this back to the roots. We're not going to let this stream on Netflix and get buried in the, in the in-home devices, right? Which I think is, it lends quite a lesson to business because if you have any live element of your business, whether it's live events, live workshops, conferences, it's the same model, right? You could do it all online. You could shove everybody on Zoom, but you're not going to get the same experience. You'll never compete with live in the flesh, no matter how much technology, no matter how, no matter how big the internet gets, no matter how big the Zoom lifestyle has gotten, there still will net, you will never top the money per head, right? In business, in theater, in sports, you'll never top the money per head that you will live. And I think the biggest first lesson is, is the live element that you just said, right? Committing to live and not letting it get away and not letting it just bury itself for a dollar ninety nine rental on Netflix down the road. And it just becomes nowhere near the blockbuster that this has now become. This is an old school blockbuster sales machine right now. This and is it's good old fashioned. Experience. Build it up. Put it in the theaters. Six hundred million dollars in two weekends. We're going into the third weekend right now at the time of this recording. This movie will exceed a billion dollars in sales probably in like the first 90 days, which is, I mean, easy. That's e But, but Aaron, not on Netflix, not on no. Apple movies, not on Amazon prime. And it definitely mm -hmm. wouldn't have done that on those platforms. But the fact is it will still go on those platforms. Eventually. Eventually. Yes. And it will still make all the same money that it would have before, but sticking to the guns of the experience. No pun intended. Right. <laughs> right. You talk about the live element, but there's, yeah. There, when you have to remember that when there's competition in your marketplace, how do you stand out? Mm -hmm. Well, the number one way to stand out is experience. What kind of experience do you offer to your customer? And in this particular case, they said the single best experience for watching this movie is going to be in a theater, mm -hmm. big comfy chairs, yeah. audio off the chart, yep. huge yes. screen. You know, this is the way that this has to be experienced. Right. And, and it was a home run in my mind because th there's, there's no way you would get the same feel. I mean, you and I were talking about this and we won't, we won't spoil anything. Right. But if you saw the original Top Gun, you'll remember the aviation scenes were, were amazing, yes. especially for what they could do with movies back this then. This is 1986. 1986. 1986. Right? So I watched this one and I found myself tensing up many times. Me too during this movie, especially around the flight scenes. Because if you don't know, they filmed Tom Cruise in the jets. So it looks like he's flying the jets, but obviously he's not flying the jets because he can't fly an F-16. So they had a pilot in front of him. So when they're whipping through all the mountains at you know, oh, Mach so 2, good. Mach 3, his body is slamming back and forth against the jet. And you can, you can feel the abuse that his body is taking and it is tense, it's man. Tense. It was so good. It's tense. And, 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 and again, you had to be in the theater to experience that. So the, the, the experiential element that you just mentioned is spot on. I don't think you achieve that at home. I mean, you could have a great home theater. No. You and I do. It Not enough people cool, have that level. Not enough people have that but, level. But the surround sound of the good old fashioned movie theater. I mean, you were probably at a great theater. I was at a great was. theater, great seats kind of reclined back a little bit. Yep. But man, it was, it was, it was palpitating. It was exciting. And I don't know if you noticed this, Aaron, but, and maybe this didn't happen where you are. I, I saw it in Florida, in Naples, where I was watching the movie. You were obviously saw it in the Cayman Islands where you are. Did Tom Cruise come out before the movie started and do his like one minute talk to the audience? Did that happen with where no. you were? No. So interestingly, he did an introduction. I've never seen this before. He said, Hey, welcome to the movie. We made this for you. I can't tell you how excited I am. It's four years of work. It's finally come together and sit back, relax, enjoy one of my, you know, my greatest masterpieces of all time. He spoke. That's did that really happen for you? interesting. I yeah, like I've that. never seen that before. And it was really cool the way he did that. I mean, this movie meant so much to him as a brand that he actually had this little, this little intro. It was a little speech almost. It was probably less than 90 seconds and it was great. I, I think that's very, that? very cool to, to connect with the audience. And exactly. there's a couple of things that that reminds me of. It kind of reminds me of Steve Jobs releasing a new iPhone. Sure. Right? So you 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 bond with the human, which I have to remember is people, people don't want to buy from companies. They want to buy from people. Correct, yeah. 
right? So him coming out and and realizing that and being emotional about what he's put together would just make you bond with the movie before you even it saw was, it. It was something I've never seen in movie. And I grew up with Tom Cruise. He's been my favorite actor since I was a kid. We have the same birthday. I love the guy. I mean, it was just, just, he's always been an icon. To this day, he's still my favorite actor, personally. So it was fun for me to, it's, it's fun for us to talk about this from just an entertainment standpoint, but also from a business standpoint, which we'll get to here in a little bit. I know if you're watching the show for the first time or listening, you're like, do these guys just talk about current events? And the answer is, yeah, sometimes we do, but we always we like talk about whatever we want. That's true too. But we tie it back. A lot of times we tie it back. And there are some really, really interesting business lessons here. Obviously, I think the first one we talked about, which is don't think live is dead. And certainly don't ever think the in-person experience is dead because it's the furthest thing from that. COVID was a huge setback for live. We get yeah. that. But live is back better than ever. Some people will embrace it. Some won't. Tom Cruise stood by it steadfastly. I know he was persuaded in many different circles I read to just do the whole Netflix thing and the streaming thing. And, you know, if you look at Disney with the Star Wars stories, they're amazing. There was the Boba Fett story. There's now the Obi-Wan Kenobi story. They could have easily brought these to the box office. No question. They chose to do like the six, seven episode you know, Disney series thing. I don't know what the money looks like in that, but there's no possible way. You and I both know, just looking at, at Top Gun as an example, if Disney said, let's do an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, two and a half hours, like like yep. Top Gun, versus the 40 minute, six episodes, I don't think the money's even close, Aaron, from live to- I, I don't I know that industry how it well enough to, to be able to give a, a judgment call on it, but I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't, I don't see how- I don't know how it, how it could be, be right? But, you know, we're, we're not, you know, producers. So, I mean, what do we know? But I, I certainly don't think it would the experience. I didn't even watch it. I haven't right? seen it yet. Yeah. I'm talking about Obi-Wan now, if it right? Had it come out in theater, I would have gone and watched it. 100%. Now, I'm getting ready to watch the Obi-Wan thing because I love Star Wars. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Uh, but yeah. I have to, like, carve out that time to sit down now. I love the 7 p.m. Saturday night, next week, good old-fashioned. My wife and I bought the tickets a week in advance. She had really no interest in it. So what I did was... This might help you if you haven't seen it yet, because she's a lot younger than me. So she didn't grow up with Top Gun like we did. I said, we're going to watch Top Gun 1 on Netflix on Friday night. She's like, oh, OK, fine. You know, military movie, really exciting, right? And then we're going to go see it in the box. We're going to see it in the movie theater on Saturday night. Now, I'm so glad I did that for her. And for me, it was good to see it again, even though I've seen it 32 times. Um, the connections from Top Gun 1 to Top Gun 2 Maverick were, were unbelievable. I love the way they tied it together. If you don't see Top Gun 1 before Top Gun Maverick, the new one, you will a lot of it won't make sense. I don't know about that. I think they did a really good job of making it so that you could see it without seeing number one. I you guess they could have a much could. better experience if you saw number one first. But the references that you catch along the way yeah. will mean nothing. And there were at least, I counted a half a dozen to a dozen really important references from Top Gun 1 that tied it all together and made it way more emotional and moving for me. Maybe not you, but because of the relationship with Goose, he died in Top Gun 1. I don't know if you remember who Penny Benjamin is, the girl. Yep. The, do you, I don't. I won't give anything away, but you know, there's there's some there's some ties that go way way back to the young Top Gun Tom Cruise, and, and yeah, you, I think a lot the, of it you the, don't catch along the way, and why I think the, the relationship with Iceman too is is much more poignant if you've seen number one. It won't make any sense the Val Kilmer thing if you don't see Top Gun one, and you won't yeah. even know what Rooster even means. Like, why? What? What's with this relationship with the kid? Well, the kid right. is the kid is as old. It's like you and me sitting in the jet. We flow to get, we fly together 11 years. It's his son. You yeah. wouldn't have known. Why did he hold his son back from being in the Navy for four years? Like, there's so many things that. Oh, you're giving stuff away. Yeah, sorry, 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 stop. sorry, sorry. Yeah, stop. I, okay, yeah, stop let's, me if I go. Let's talk I, about how this ties into to sales and business as well some more. So this movie was the single biggest recruitment tool for the U.S. Navy in history. I don't know if you were aware of that. Of course. They always when, are. Uh, Anytime something like this happens, it always is. Yeah. When Top Gun 1 came out, mm -hmm. the, the surge of men that joined the Navy was like nothing they had ever seen. Right? So you've got this movie that had the, all of this impact, financial impact, employment impact, you know, movie impact, history of movie impact. And everybody said it's perfectly teed up to do a sequel. 
But and it's how many years? Thirty. Thirty six years. years of, as you say, sequel. I still can't wrap my head around. Not ten years later. Not twenty years later. Not even thirty years later. It's just really, really amazing. Well, what's what I find interesting about that is that Cruz was pitched scripts multiple times to do a sequel, and he said there is zero chance I am doing a sequel and potentially tainting the legacy of that movie mm-hmm. until I see something that blows my doors off. And he stuck to his guns on it. He sure did. And I, I think there's something to be learned there because when you look at some of the other actors, and I'm going to talk about Bruce Willis a little bit um, in a second with regards to the business side as well. That was the era when Bruce Willis was also a megastar, right? We look at the diehards and yeah. – um, there's a whole bunch of other movies uh, th- that th- that I could come up with, but the Die Hards were obviously his his biggest one. So Tom Cruise and Bruce Willis, at the same time, were mega superstars. Bruce Willis ended up doing lesser and lesser and lesser quality films to the point where it almost got a bit embarrassing. Yes, I think that happens to a lot of actors, and it does happen to a lot of actors. And we're going to explain why. Versus Tom Cruise has handpicked things that have kept him relevant because of the quality that he demanded. So there's something to be said for taking a little extra time before you put something out into the marketplace to make sure that you 100% believe that it's going to be impactful and stand behind it. Sure. And, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't times when you should put something out with, you know, a, a minimum viable product or, 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 or to try and test the market to see if they're open to it. But if you already know the market is open to what you have, then spending a little extra time on making the experience really stand out for your customer has a tremendous impact, which we're seeing in this movie. The other thing I want to talk about from a business standpoint is I'm going to read some stats for you right now. I know you're like me. You like stats. So The numbers Tom, don't lie, right, Aaron? We talk about it all the time. Numbers don't lie. Math is not an opinion, Math which is, is why I love opinion. it. Well so this is Tom Cruise as an actor. Okay? So good. Leading role, domestic and international box office as a leading role, 38 movies, $9 billion in revenue. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. When you combine his leading ensemble members, supporting cameos, narrators, you've got another $3 billion in revenue. So 11 to $12 billion in revenue as an actor. You talk about, he, he's, he's Tom Brady-esque. Oh, yeah. You know, when it comes to, to, the, to the acting realm. Now, the important thing is, is we have a client, Andrew, who's a, a producer in Hollywood. And he talks about how he teaches actors to start their own production companies so that they can participate in a different revenue stream in the movies and not just be the talent sitting around waiting for somebody to call. And the other day I was talking to this gentleman and he brought up Bruce Willis and Tom Cruise as his business example. He said, Bruce Willis was so hot that all he did was basically take acting roles and spend all his money. And in his words, not mine, so I don't know if it's true, he said, Bruce Willis is now broke. And on top of that, Bruce Willis has a health condition right now, which which is making it worse. And he has to take crappy movies just to pay bills, which is very traditional for actors and actresses. He said, what, what smart actors do is they become entrepreneurial and they become producers. They start to be part of the production of the movie itself and they won't take roles unless they can also be a producer. Mm. So they start production companies, they take a back end on the movie. Now, we just talked about what Tom Cruise has generated revenue wise as an actor. As a producer, 12 movies, International and domestic, $5.2 billion in revenue. Unreal. As an executive producer, another $400 million in revenue. Story creator, $157 million in revenue. So now, not only is he the actor, the talent, he's also part of the ownership of the movie itself. 
Now, what does that mean to you? Well, it's brilliant, number one. I mean, what do you what do you hear when you when what what do you think when I tell you that? Well, the first thing I think about business show here, right, is yep. he found a way to be not only the key entertainer in the lead role, but also a way to participate in the revenue growth of the movie industry, being an owner in the movie, not just an actor in the movie, right? So he, so it's a very entrepreneurial thought process for him. He could easily just keep taking the $20 million payday, showing up, doing the role and walking away. It's way easier that way. But he's, if you know Tom Cruise and you know his backstory, he's also a very, um, and I'm the same way, and it's, it's kind of a down, it's a downfall for guys like us where we're very, um, you know, we almost want to micromanage things too much, right? We re we're perfectionists. We want to really get in there. I'm the same way. I think you are to a degree, but I think you're probably better at it than me. You're, you're more that way than I am, but yeah. I, I respect it. I usually surround myself with people like that because they're, they offset my lack in that, that area. Right. And, and I don't like say it to brag because I, it is a downfall. Like sometimes you just, you hold on too tight and he's been like that. But by the way, this is one of the reasons why he's never been able to have a marriage workout, right? He's, he has... He has these control issues, if you will, and he wants his hands and everything. So there's an element of it's made him amazingly successful because of what you're talking about. But the downfall of it, of it is you hold on too tight and you can sever relationships as well. And that's, that's, that's I mean, like everything, there's a trade-off and you, it, there's a big price tag here that has a trade-off as well, right? So Yeah, um, I mean, when you, when you want to become hugely successful and we're going off in a different vein, but yeah, who cares? Yeah. Our, it's our show. My bad on I, that, but it's. I look you know, at I look at, at like somebody the... like a like a Conor McGregor, mm -hmm. right? Conor McGregor is is most people know who he is now because he, because of his rise in in mixed martial arts. Right. He talked about how he was obsessed with being the best in the world, and when he was obsessed, he said, "Honestly, it's tough on my relationships. It's tough on my health. It's sure. tough on my sure. my friendships. It's tough on everything." But when he became champion, that obsession paid off. And what ended up happening is he started to uh, loosen the reins a little bit. He started proper 12 whiskey. He sold yeah. that for 600 million. He fought Floyd Mayweather. He made a hundred million there. He's yeah. got an app now for fitness. He's got a supplement line. He's, he's trying to follow the Tom Brady playbook and he's become extraordinarily wealthy. Do, do you know what's happened to him over the last three years? He can't win a fight. Yeah. He's, he's veered off because so he's not the, obsessed anymore. Yeah, obsessed anymore. He got, he got, he got to his destination. He doesn't have the drive anymore. No, he's got, he got soft. And I'm not. And I'm I would imagine. And listen, Aaron, I would imagine that everybody. Get, Tom Cruise will get there at some point. He'll get there. We'll talk about Brady in a minute too, because he's another example of just timeless production, right? At some point, you finally say, "I think I've arrived, and I don't have the drive to keep arriving." Yeah, I want to have some type of balance, maybe, and and live my life a little bit. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yep. I would do 100% what he did. What I would actually do is I would give up fighting, because you've got to be a certain animal to win yeah, in want, that and world. You, you got to start thinking about longevity and not yeah. living in pain. And right, there's a lot of that too. Yeah, it, exactly. But the point that I want to make is that he's another example. See, Conor McGregor built his notoriety and he built his audience and then he didn't just rely on getting paid to show up and perform like Tom Cruise mm -hmm. as well. He said, I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to start my own production company, which he did. It's called the Mac life. I'm going to yeah. start my own, uh, my own whiskey brand. I'm going to start my own clothing line. There's a lot of people that listen to this show right now and they're in the, they're basically in the talent role. They're in the solopreneur under somebody else's umbrella, under somebody else's banner. And, and I think it's really important to think about your future from the perspective of you can be immensely talented and maybe if you're immensely talented, you can stay under that umbrella forever and you can make good money, but you'll never make great money. The people who make great money think one step or two steps higher than their current position. Right, right. How do I get an ownership stake maybe in the umbrella company? How do I white label what the company has? How do I maybe, maybe create my own version of it and take the risk and go out on my own and do something similar, but it's under my equity? How do I, how do I maybe create some type of joint ventures or referrals so I'm not solely reliant on the umbrella? Right. That's what guys like Tom Brady, Tom Cruise, Conor McGregor, 
Tony Tall, Robbins. Tony Robbins, right? right? Remarkably talented individuals, but talent fades. You got to remember that talent fades. We're all going to die. We all get older. We get tired. We get, you know, whatever the Run circumstances out of energy are. to keep doing it. Right. Right. You, at, one, at some point you have to think about how am I going to create leverage so that it doesn't have to solely be about my talent forever. And another way to look at that is how do I create equity, which is to your point, what Tom Cruise is doing now is he's not. He knows he's 59-ish, I think, right? He Wait, knows. Let's stop. And let's just stop right there. I mean, how good does this guy look? He looks incredible. First thing I said, I turn to my wife in the movie. I say, if I could look half that good at 59, man, oh, man. I oh, mean, you're, 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 being, you're being, you know, humble. You, you look amazing. But that's 20 years away. Well, actually, it's 10 years away now. that I, You know I'm going to be 49 next month? So, We're all right, so he's got me by 10 years. You know how close you are to that number. Jeez, I, you, you stopped me for a minute. I'm like, now you just like ruined my day here, right? So I'm 10 years out, but he, two things. He took really good care of himself. Always so we'll, Let's talk about this as well, right? But to your point, how do I not just do the thing, but how do I start to build equity and see a few steps ahead? I'm always intrigued by people. And I think you and I are great at this too. I'm always intrigued by these icons who are always at least two or three steps ahead of the masses with everything. Tom mm-hmm. Brady comes to mind. Another icon idol of mine is how did he stay so far ahead of other athletes with the way he took care of himself and the way he practiced and prepared to be able to still show up at camp? By the way, two days ago, he shows up at mini camp at 44, like he's 22, all excited, giddy. Like, can you imagine to be able to maintain that level of enthusiasm? Number one, energy, number two, and interest, number three, Aaron Tom still Cruise obsessed. has done the same thing. Mission impossible. Mm-hmm. 36 years later, to be able to bring this much energy, excitement, and enthusiasm to the Top Gun brand, when really it's forgotten about Aaron at this point. Like Top Gun, it's 1986, is a forgotten memory movie. It It's just amazing how this much interest can be maintained three, almost four decades later is incredible to me. And it's because of he maintained relevance. Like you said, he chose the right movies. He was careful. Selection process was good. But he also was part of the business model of movie and entertainment. Tom, and because, by the oh, way, and, Tom and Brady and Tom Brady has done the same thing. He's and think really about this, become part of was, the business of the NFL, right? When we look at Tom as, as a whole, right? And because he was part of the business, it also incentivized him to do more to make this successful. I don't know if you've been watching – Tom Cruise has been touring the entire world for the last 12 months, promoting the release of this movie. Good old fashioned in-person traveling around the world promotion. Here we go again, grassroots. Now, if if he was just an actor in the movie, do you really think he would have gone to those lengths? Nope, I don't, because he was an owner as well. Because he's an owner. He was vested in the success of this, right? But also, Aaron, also, he just loved what he created also. Yes, yeah, there was definitely love and passion behind it, but there was also an incentive for him to to shoot a pre-roll to the movie, to travel around the world, to go on all the shows. And that's the I think that's the other difference of just being a a performer in your business, maybe under someone else's umbrella, mm-hmm. and being an owner. You get far more energy to go above and beyond right. when you know that there's that upside for you. And there's, when you know that you are an owner and not just an operator. Correct. And take a, take I know a, for me, yeah. If, if you looked at my, if anybody looked at your schedule or my schedule, I mean, I can't, I mean, I can't obviously can't speak for your schedule, but I know it's very busy. I can only speak for my schedule. My schedule is absurd every single day, day in, day out. And when anybody comes into my office and they see my calendar, they go, is this a normal day for you? I say, yeah. And they say, how long have you been doing this for? A uh, five years straight. I say, how, how could you possibly sustain that level of output for five years. I say, because I'm motivated, because it's mine, it's my baby, and I want to see it succeed. There's a different level of energy you can maintain over time when it's your baby. Agreed. Agreed. And that's that's one of the reasons why if you're maybe watching or listening and you're a sales professional or you're starting a business or you have a business, but maybe it's not all your business or you're working for someone else, right? It's The quicker you can get into equity and ownership and being a founder or an owner, the more enthusiasm you'll be able to have and maintain for a long period of time. I think that's the big lesson here is is 
going the distance and staying relevant for a long time, right? We talked about a couple different icons, which I want to touch on. Obviously, Tom Cruise, I don't think anybody will ever top. You know who did it for a long time, which was close, was Stallone, Stallone maintained relevancy for a long time as well. He did. Yeah. Then he started trailing off with the weak little feeble movies towards the end. And well, and I think that that happened because he's not the same level of actor as Tom Cruise. He's definitely is. not. He's not as elegant as a Tom Cruise. You're right. Yeah. There's there's but Tom Cruise is the only one in entertainment. So really, uh, you know, I, I want to stay focused on three names. Right. It's Tom Cruise, obviously, number one. It's Tom Brady, number two in sports. It's just people can't even imagine what he's doing. They're watching him now with seven Super Bowl rings, coming out of retirement 10 minutes after he retired and going again and still having that same passion. And then there's Tony Robbins, which almost everybody knows. I mean, at 60 some, I don't know if he's 64, 63, but the guy's taking stage for 10 hours a day, Aaron, and doing, I think he's back to live now, but even when we weren't live, he was doing like 10 hour a day Zooms. And how do you do what he's done where he's carrying four and five day personal development, transformational events, for four and five days at a time. You and I have done collectively between us probably 500 plus live events. We know the energy physically and mentally that has to go into performing. It's very much like entertainment. He's still doing it. He still loves it. And he's doing it through massive pain. He has back issues, knee issues. He's gone through. He's just released a new book called Life Force where he talks about all the stem cell um, stuff that he's done to, to recover and keep himself still in the game, still relevant, still going, right? So I think of the, like these three names come to mind for me. Tony Robbins in the speaking business, Tom Brady in the sports business, Tom Cruise in the entertainment business, decade after decade after decade. Now, Tom Brady obviously can't play football for 40 years, but to be able to well, play it for 23 years is equivalent to probably Tom Cruise acting for 40. I think it's, I think Tom Brady's results on a, on a, on a, in a career where the average lifespan is 2.9 years. Is, is, is it five, two years, five years? 2.9 years is the average that, career in right. the NFL. I thought it was five point something. Nope. That's incredible. Uh, so it's beyond incredible what yeah. in there. And what I want to say about that from a business standpoint, and I'm surprised you haven't brought it up yet. Oh, it's coming. Is he's coming back for another year. Uh-huh. He's going to make a bunch of money. He's got a bunch of endorsements. He's got a bunch of companies. But did you see the deal he signed to be a commentator? I actually thought that was not even real. Was that real? I'm pretty I, sure it was real. I didn't real. think it was. I thought it was going to be a deal offered if he didn't play again, but I'm not really sure. Oh, now I got to look it up. But listen, to your point on Brady, so what a lot of people don't know, we did a show on Tom Brady, the business of Tom Brady, really his TB12 sports brand. He he started his own TB12 sports brand five or six years ago. So as a player, we talked about equity, Aaron, right? Yep. When have you ever seen an athlete who's still playing start a company, hire a CEO around your brand while you're still in the game? The TB12 method, TB12 sports is a monster brand right now. And just last year, he started a men's clothing brand just called Brady. So as he's still playing, so to your point earlier, Still performing at the highest level, but making sure he's building equity positions along the way. Very few entertainers, athletes, and business people think about this. They think about making the money right now, banking the money right now, but not building long-term stakes in equity. Tom Brady, another perfect example of that. Tony Robbins, to our other point, has interest. If you read Tony Robbins' books, Money Master the Game, Life Force, and the book. Real Thick Books, he talks about he has massive interest. Massive equity in big companies, financial planning companies, stem oh, cell companies. He owns, uh, he owns part of the LA Galaxy, the, the, the soccer team. So the point is he could have just banked money as the speaker, personal development guy. Tom Brady could have just banked money as the athlete. Tom Cruise could have just banked money as the actor. But what's going on here is they're taking equity stakes and they're building long-term residual income positions along the way. That's the big lesson of the icons, really, it started with Tom Cruise and and and, and Maverick and. Oh, and topic, I have something so exciting to talk about. Did you find it? I, well, first off, I did find it. Tom Brady, SB Nation, signs most lucrative broadcaster deal in history: ten years, three hundred and seventy-five million dollars with Fox. That would be when, though. That would be after he gets out of the league. It's it's it's, so it's like, like on the it's table like Drew Brees. For him. It's like Drew Brees. When you're done, when you're done, you start. We got wow. 
10 years, $375 million, most lucrative broadcasting contract in the history of the world. Guy hasn't even finished throwing a ball. Hasn't even started the new season yet. And he's already planted the seed of, I'm going to be the highest paid ever in a new space. Right. When I'm so not. these are the big lessons. This isn't about you and I sitting in an F-19 fighter jet right now and talking about Top Gun. Although that's fun. I could talk about the movie all day, but we don't want to give it away to the folks that haven't seen it. It's really about how do they maintain this level of relevancy? How do they maintain this level of interest and energy? A lot of that's how you take care of yourself. That's a big one, right? You can't go the distance, thinking. Aaron, energy-wise and interest-wise if you don't take care of you internally and externally. That's a big, big, we've, we've done full episodes on this. That's a big, big lesson here is what are you doing to take care of your health to maintain the physical and mental energy to go the distance? I can tell you that Tom Cruise, Tom Brady, and Tony Robbins, my big three on this episode, are absolute, they're militant about how they take care of their bodies and their minds and how they live their lifestyle. That's why they're able to go the distance with the energy and the interest. It isn't just because they're good at what they do. It's because of the way they take care of themselves. I agree with you 100%. And I'm going to say the other side of it is when you're hot – as a performer, as a business owner, as an offer, when you got the world by the tail, really got to think about how you can take the most advantage of it at the time. You got to be thinking three steps ahead right. before your skill starts to fade or before you start to become irrelevant. That's what these guys are masters at. Tom Brady's already secured what's next while he's relevant to stay relevant. Tom Cruise was always securing what was next. Let's talk about the opposite of this. I, and I you know just you read my mind, man. I, I wanted to do that. And you know what comes to mind for me? Oh, no, I've I mean, got it. I've got it. We're I don't not, mean to cut I'm you off first, but I'm thinking of all of these icon bands that have to go perform again 20 years later to make money. Well, I think the icon band thing is, is in some cases, you're right. I think they're out there performing because they need the money. But I also think on the other side, they if miss you're it, right. If you're an artist, you have to perform. Like you'd perform on the side of the street for free. You, you have to. It's in your DNA. Mm. So I think there's I think there's probably half and half in yeah, that yeah, scenario. But I want to talk about a specific example that I don't know if you saw the other day, but your mind is going to be born. <laughs> That's hard okay. to do. So John Elway. Loved him. Loved him. Loved right? him. Yeah. One of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. In our era, growing up as a kid, we saw John Elway play. So John Elway had a contract that was structured in a kind of a unique way. When he retired, he essentially got paid $25 million over time mm -hmm. that he had set aside as basically a retirement account for himself, which in its own right is, is not stupid. No, it's, it's very smart. It's very smart, right? So when he retired, the owner of the Denver Broncos said, I don't want to pay you this out over time. I'm going to give you a one-time offer. I will give you 10% of the Denver Broncos for $15 million of what I owe you. And if you want an additional 10%, all you have to do is give me $5 million to make up the difference. And you'll have 20% of the Denver Broncos. Is that right? Correct. You can research it online when, when we're done this. I was reading this story the other day. So John Elway says, nope, pay me my money. In my mind, not thinking about the future. Now, some people might say, well, I mean, how much money did, did John Elway have? Could he afford to, to, to make that decision? So on and so forth. He made $50 million playing in the NFL plus endorsements. He could have pulled it off. No question. So he says, no. What's really Ooh, sad can you, is no, that- I can only imagine, Aaron- what the net worth of the Broncos is since then. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> at the time that he was offered oh, this money, oh, it's coming. the Denver Broncos were valued at $190 million. I just look at these franchises, yeah. Now, he took his $20 million, and then he proceeded to lose $7.5 million of it in a Ponzi scheme. Wasn't he like in the car business, something with the car business or? Yeah, he, I mean, he's a successful business guy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that John Elway is not a successful business right, guy. Right. He, he's also been the GM of the Broncos. Yep. John Elway's just fine financially. Yep. However, he lost seven and a half million of that 20 million in a Ponzi scheme. Didn't know that. So, you know, th that's gone, you know, and, and who knows what he did with the rest. I have no idea. The Denver Broncos just sold this week 
for $4.5 billion. Which means he would have taken a 10 to 20% payout. $976 million is what he lost <gasps> by not taking the deal. Oh, man. So, there's my office. back perfectly to the original point of the episode, which is if you can find a way to have ownership and equity along the way while you're doing what it is that you do and what you're great at, you're building, you're planting seeds. Exactly. You're building equity. And wow, that's a... Listen, we didn't even talk about Jordan. We were supposed to. Can you imagine that to this day, the Michael Jordan, Air Jordan brand is more relevant? My, my son is 11. He's addicted to the Air Jordan brand. He's never seen the guy play live. My son it, ever has five Air Jordans. It's like, so, so you look at the... I can't believe we didn't talk about Jordan. The ability to... He makes more money with his Air Jordan apparel brand than he's made in any basketball arenas. It's not even close because well, he took I read interest the other day early that, that, on in a business. Yeah, I read not too long ago that what he gets paid out in license fees, I guess is what it would be. I don't know the structure of his deal from Nike for the Air Jordan brand every single year is still more than LeBron James makes playing basketball. And LeBron James, by the way, just just becomes like the first billionaire basketball player, just, just to give you context there, right? Like yeah, I think LeBron James makes about $50 million a year playing yeah. basketball. So you look at what Jordan did. Jordan could have, same thing. Jordan could have just been the basketball player and got paid to be the basketball guy and maybe got paid to do some announcing. But, but he took a really smart, active, enthusiastic interest in the brand of Air Jordan. And I'm going to tell you who else is going to pull this off the same way as Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods has a very similar deal with Nike and golf that Jordan had with Nike and Air, in the Air Jordan brand. Um, Tiger had some 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 rough patches along the way, but I think that at least in America, America has the shortest memory of any country on the planet, I believe. Right, so they kind of forget, they kind of forget things fast. But Jordan, I, Jordan, I think Tiger Woods will he's he's done a great job with owning things as well. You know what he just opened, Aaron? I don't know if you know this, but if you look at his Instagram page or you follow him at all, he just opened with his investors and his team. This is like two years in the making. He just opened in Orlando, and I think there's another one in Arizona, the first ever 18-hole real green miniature golf course. 18 holes, miniature golf, so just putting, grass in Orlando. Two 18-hole courses in like on like one complex. It's a huge project that, again, he's still taking these business interests in things as he's trying to recover and still play in PGA championships. It's just another great example. Jordan, Tiger Woods, Tony Robbins, Tom Brady, obviously Tom Cruise here, topic of the day. What they're doing along the way is awesome. We love watching them perform. But take a step back and look at their business interests is really the lesson here today and how they take equity positions, investment positions, toll booth positions, residual income positions, partnership positions, and that's the lesson, because if you're not doing any of those things, you're pretty expendable. You can be gone in a minute. Your skills are deteriorating by the day. So you've got to take advantage of when you've got the hot streak going on. And you forgot to mention, Michael Jordan also has a huge ownership stake in the Charlotte Bobcats. That's right. Um, He's a North Carolina guy, so a little, which little, he, little home, home team there. I remember he took it, I feel like it was probably 12 to 15 years ago. It was a while ago, yeah. And at the time, nobody cared about that team, and it wasn't an expensive buy-in in in the grand scheme of things, but it was expensive for him to buy into that. And that alone has made him a billionaire. Forget all of his other stuff. He's a billionaire just from owning that basketball team. Yep. It's it's, it's fascinating. And it's it's so interesting to watch, too. But again, a lot of – I just feel like today as a whole, just – you know, at least here in America, I feel like people, they're, they're so stuck in the right now. Like the information that's being fed right now is the information being fed right now, but they're never looking or questioning, right? How does, like, to the point of today, Aaron, right? How did Tom Cruise pull off a sequel 36 years later? There's the questions I ask, right? How is Tom Brady starting two companies while he's playing? What does that look like? How did he, what does the infrastructure look like? I, like, I dug into that and I was like, well, who's the CEO? How did he get hired? What's the connection, right? I like to really dig in. T- why is Tiger Woods doing this? How is Tony Robbins taking an interest in a financial planning company? How did it happen? Why did it happen? Who's involved? What was the money? These are the big, big questions that entrepreneurs and real good thinkers and, cr- and, and critical thinkers and business owners ask. And they're really good questions to get answers to because they're going to teach you so much on maybe how you can 
change your outlook on how you position yourself in business in the years to come. Really, really, that's what I want you to take away from today is not how cool we are sitting in an F-19 fighter jet. I know you've been thinking it the whole time. And let's be honest. You've been thinking it the whole time. I get it. But that's not the point of the show. Don't get distracted. The point of the show was how does a guy like Tom Cruise 36 years later maintain the relevancy, the significance, the brand, the equity? You, you brought some great stats up earlier, Aaron, on, on what he architected with Top Gun Maverick. I mean, it is just genius every single step of the way from a business and an entertainment standpoint, what he did. And a lot of this can be applied to other industries. You might be watching this. You might own a restaurant. You might own a software company. You might own a consulting agency, right? You can still apply the same business lessons and principles and philosophies to what you do, which at the end of the day is what? How can I own more? How can I create better joint ventures? How can I create other income streams? And if I went away tomorrow, how can I still get paid and have equity? Those are the big questions. And we always want to bring that out of our viewers too, is how do you, how do you think bigger? How do you think better? And how do you think more faster and in, in, in down the road more, right? That's the intuitiveness that I think is really what I want our viewers to grab more than anything is how do I, how do I think a few steps ahead and how do I, how do I operate a few steps ahead? Because the most successful in the world are always, it feels like there's just, they always have such a gap. It's almost like they're, there's just so many people behind them. I feel like there are always so many steps ahead. Um, and there's a reason why, because they're looking and thinking so many steps ahead. Absolutely. If you haven't seen Top Gun Maverick yet, don't wait. Listen, here's the last thing I'm going to say, Aaron. Don't wait for it to get on Netflix. Don't wait for it to hit the streaming. I mean, you can if you want. Two things I got to say. Go see it in the theater, but Agreed. don't go see it in the theater without just like have fun and go watch number one first, especially if you've never seen it. You have to watch number one, right? We told our whole team this the other day because they're all younger than us, right? Hey guys, you see all this Top Gun stuff going on, but just go watch, go rent number one. It's a 1986 movie. It can be cheesy at times. The production value isn't amazing because it's 2022, right? My, my wife was like, man, this is kind of boring at times and the production isn't that great. I'm like, yeah, it's true. It's a nostalgia play for me. 1986. Yeah, 1986, expecting it. But then all of a sudden, one night later, 2022, it was like, this was one of the best movies I ever saw. Well, and you know why it was so great? Because you took the time to watch number one and connect the dots. So I would yep. say go do that. And if you can, catch it in the theater because it is a masterpiece and it will be a billion dollar movie. I mean, I say within 90 days, Aaron, but it looks if like it's it, going to be not within already. 30 days. Could it, it could be, be already? With, it's six, 700 million on week two, week three. So I think realistically, you're probably in 45 days, it's a billion dollar blockbuster sales machine. And that was the point of the day today. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm thinking about staying in the fighter jets from here on out. I love these. I love. I don't these know shows about you. Where, where we just talk about whatever we want. But I want you to really mull over the F nineteen scene here for sales velocity TV moving forward. Okay. And again, if you're listening, what we're saying is since we go live before we go audio is uh, salesvelocitytv.com. This is episode eighty one, and we uh, we've somehow manufactured the ability to be sitting in F nineteen. It's a, it's comfortable, right? I feel like the jet is not as tight as I thought it was going to be. I feel yeah, really good inside the, the the cockpit here. Absolutely. And, do you feel, and, do you and feel got, restricted in your cockpit or do you feel good? No, and I've got three G's on me right now and it's not bothering me. Clearly, I'm, I'm a specimen. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I think the modern technology of these F-19 fighter jets has really paid off. I don't feel as restricted as I think I would have in maybe one of the Top Gun 1 jets. So I want to just thank Tom Cruise and the crew for allowing us to get into a jet today and perform from an F-19 cockpit because, man, it is just – I just want to go Mach 10 in this thing. How about you? Yeah, it's luxury. It's luxury. The Ferrari of planes, man. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it there. Hope you guys enjoyed this. SalesVelocityTV.com. Catch it live. Episode 81 here. We're in the fighter jets, and we'll be back for a for a, a regularly scheduled Sales Velocity TV show next week. That's Aaron. I'm Andrew. Wait a minute. That's Goose. I'm Maverick. We'll see you in the next one. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sales Velocity TV is powered by Pipeline Pro the ultimate all-in-one sales pipeline management and marketing automation platform that makes all others obsolete. And we can prove it. Take a tour at gopipelinepro.com. See you on the next episode.